At 7.38, the morning of May 12, 1989, a Southern Pacific freight train loaded with potash, a sand-like potassium-based substance used in fertilizers, derailed through the four-degree curve on the embankment alongside the Cajon Creek Wash, only a few yards from the bridge over Highland Avenue. The train was en route from Mojave to Long Beach and had been descending the treacherous 4,200-foot Cajon Pass when tragedy struck at Duffy Street. The derailment was the result of a number of factors, the primary one being the underestimation of the weight of the cargo. The manifest indicated a weight of 6,151 tons of trona, a mineral used to make potash, while the actual weight was closer to 9,000 tons, 3,000 tons heavier than originally estimated. A second factor was the train had less braking power than the lead engineer Frank Holland had thought. Holland believed he had four locomotives with full dynamic braking and one with intermittent braking. He actually had three locomotives or less with full dynamics. The helper engineer, Larry Hill, was aware that the dynamic braking in one of the two helper engines that were added to the train was not working. He didn't tell Holland because he thought the dispatchers had already told him. Frank Holland assumed the two helper diesels had full dynamic braking because no one had told him otherwise. Holland judged his operation of the train and his estimates of the need for braking power on the car tonnage profile that was based on a train 3,000 tons lighter than it actually was. The profile was estimated by two Southern Pacific Railroad clerks because Lake Minerals Corporation, the shipper, did not assign weights to the cargo when it was delivered to the substation at Mojave. One clerk, based on his experience, estimated the weight at 75 tons per car. This was only a temporary estimate used to allow the computer to release the cars for further processing. When Southern Pacific clerk Thomas Blair received the shipping documents from Lake Minerals, the tonnage information was again not included. He felt rushed to get the tonnage information to the rate clerk, so he made an attempt to obtain the weight information by locating Lake Minerals in the phone directory, but found the company not listed. He used his experience and came up with an estimate of 60 tons per car. Lake Minerals had the cars loaded to a capacity of 100 tons each. Engineers Holland and Hill talked by radio only on an infrequent basis during the descent down the grade. Hill did nothing until the train exceeded 40 miles per hour because he believed the engineer was doing all he could to slow it down. At that point, he pulled the air, sending the train into emergency without telling Holland about it. The move, which did not work, cut all the braking action of the dynamic brakes. This occurred eight miles from the derailment. The train increased speed and was traveling 15 to 20 miles per hour faster than the original estimate of 90 miles per hour. A full 110 miles per hour at the time it left the curve and plunged down the embankment, slamming into homes. The curve is restricted to 30 miles per hour. The damage to the first engine of the train shows the force of the impact. The cab roof and most of the cab has been ripped off. The first scene, taken from Duffy Street, shows the extent of the destruction. The potash material covers the houses, the cars, and the street. Police and fire departments are the first to arrive, and they rapidly begin to look for survivors. No one knew how many people may have been trapped in the wreck.
as the extent of the damage becomes apparent. The call goes out for more rescue crews and for more equipment. A plan is being put into action to deal with the tons of crumpled steel in the cargo of sodium carbonate. One of the first rescues is the dog that is caught under a fence. The lead locomotive crashed down into the yard, pushing two autos into the fence, pinning the dog. The search goes on for other survivors and a trained crewman is still missing. Two of the five-man crew were killed in the wreck. As the injured are pulled from their damaged homes, their injuries are being attended to by the medics. Preparations are being made to transport the survivors to hospitals. Specially trained canine units are brought in to help in the search. Their keen sense of smell is needed to find victims that could be buried in the rubble. Dogs are soon to become heroes in the search for victims as they find a survivor buried under six feet of potash and debris. As more men and equipment arrive, the search centers on specific areas of the wreck. A backhoe is being used to help dig through the mountains of potash. Rescue crews dig by hand as holes are made under the rail cars. The search is slow as no one wants to disturb the position of the cars.
special cutting tools are being used to cut through the car's sides to see if anyone is trapped under the cars. Seven homes were involved in the wreck, with seven houses hit and four destroyed. The gas had to be shut off in seven of the homes because of ruptured gas lines. All that remains of some of the houses is broken walls and scattered bedroom furniture. The calm of the early morning was shattered by an avalanche of hopper cars, steel wheels, and tons of sodium carbonate. The board from one of the locomotives has been flung into the back of one of the houses. It now rests yards from the destroyed diesel. The fire department rescue crews from San Bernardino are setting up their equipment as they begin the task of removing the body of one of the crewmen. They soon realize that their equipment is not up to the task of unbending the steel in a damaged locomotive cab. The jaws of life work fine in auto wrecks, but do not have the power needed for a train wreck.
repair crew is brought in from the car shop at Colton, and with them comes the cutting torches needed to cut heavy steel. The area is being watered down to prevent a fire. Some 5,500 gallons of diesel fuel spilled from the locomotive fuel tanks. The conductor who was killed had been riding in the cab with a lead engine along with the engineer. Just before the wreck occurred, he had climbed down into the nose of the locomotive. The force of the crash had crushed the steel around him, trapping him in the cab.
It took several hours of cutting and prying to free his body from the mangled steel. Coroner prepares the body for removal to the morgue. Eyewitnesses to the wreck had this to say. I thought it was an earthquake, and I said, my God, it's the end of the world. It's the way it sounded. And I had, to, I saw it. I saw it actually happen. I came outside, and I looked for the noise, and when I looked this way, I saw these, this thing tumbling, and then tumbling, I said, oh, my God. It looked like the train was going real fast. And I, I got up and I walked in the uh, living room to see what my wife was doing. And, uh, and the time I got in the living room, all at once the uh, whole kitchen was moving towards the, toward the living room. From the embankment, the extent of the damage can be seen to the four lead units. Not one of these engines could be saved. One locomotive hit the ground so hard that the prime mover was knocked from the frame. A Southern Pacific official had this to say about the degree of damage caused by this derailment. Much worse. It's a, um, it's a bad derailment. We know that uh, in order to go off the tracks like this, it was going awfully fast. Another Southern Pacific official told us what he knew at this time about the train carrying the sodium carbonate. The 69 cars of that product, powered by uh, four diesel locomotives in the front end of the unit and uh, two helper units in the rear. We do know that the engineer on the trailing unit uh, did uh, issue a mayday call on the radio that we picked up from our dispatcher. Uh, and he said that the, the train was uh, running away and uh, unable to control the speed and was traveling at a high rate of speed. As night fell, rescuers are still searching for survivors. By 8.55 that evening, the rescue dogs had found the scent of someone buried under the potash and debris. They began sniffing and digging wildly at the dirt and immediately rescue workers went to work removing the material. 
they found 24-year-old Chris Shaw buried under six feet of the carbonate. He is pinned under a large beam and has been kept alive by an air pocket that had been formed. What we're going to have to do is we're going to have to move that loader and they're going to have to move a crane in uh, as part of the rescue operation. So you'll have to step down and this line here will have to move back because one of these uh, things is going to move in here. The rescuers are able to get an airline down to him and pump in oxygen to help him breathe until he can be free. Chris had been asleep on the sofa at the time of the wreck. He has been able to tell authorities that no one else had been in the house. By 9.45, the rescue effort has progressed to the point that rescue crews are ready to lift the beam. While the crews dig by hand, they are reinforcing the area around Mr. Shaw with plywood to help prevent a collapse of the potash. With the beam removed, the paramedics and doctors move in to attend to his injuries. An ambulance is standing by, ready to take Chris Shaw to the hospital. In all, only four people were killed and 11 people injured in what has been described as the most destructive train wreck ever.